Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the section 3 video for chapter 10, and in this one we're going to be talking about Islam's golden age. Now in the previous video when we were learning about the Abbasid dynasty, I mentioned that there was a period known as a golden age of Islamic civilization. Now remember that a golden age is a period of both great wealth as well as cultural achievement in areas such as literature and science and so forth. Let's first take a look at the source of, the great well of this great wealth that the Muslim world is experiencing at this time, which is due primarily to Muslim trade. Once I get this, there we go. Okay. So, a very important thing to note about Muslim culture is that merchants were honored. Uh, this was because Muhammad himself was a merchant. Plus, the original Muslims were nomads, and nomads historically engaged in trade to survive since they did not engage in settled farming. So the combo of the two made uh, trade a very popular profession. And this resulted in a vast trade network. Uh, now, let's look at the map here. The map shows all of the different trade routes. You notice how they picked up trade routes that went all the way over to China, okay, along the Silk Road here, all throughout North Africa. You got even up into Europe, particularly Spain, because remember, Spain was a part of the Muslim Empire, but they did a lot of business in Italy with those Italian city-states, obviously the Middle East. Now, these land routes uh, that you see, uh, particularly in the Middle East, they made regular use of camels, Um you know, while the sea merchants, they use these ships called dows. Now, you notice the sea routes, particularly in the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean, uh, these dows were lightweight ships. Uh, they sailed extensively over the water, so it was very common to see them pulling into ports, uh, not only in the Mediterranean, but as far away as the South, uh, South China Sea. Now, trade, like we've been saying all year, leads to cultural diffusion, right? Trade and warfare, they lead to cultural diffusion. Muslim merchants brought their culture with them, and they also picked up cultural elements from people they encountered. An example of, you, of this is the use of Indian numerals. Move me out of the way. You can get a better look at this. I'll move me up here. Okay, so our own number system is based off of what we call Arabic numbers, right? Here's our modern system where we got, whoop, didn't mean to do that, but anyway, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so forth, and that is kind of derived from this Arabic one, but you notice how the Arabic one is derived from an earlier Hindu system. That was because Arab merchants adapted their own number system from that of India, uh, and this was all because of trade. So the extensive trade networks meant Muslims used a money economy. Uh, and this led to new business practices, such as selling on credit and the use of checks. In fact, the word check is derived from the Arabic word sock that you see right there. Now, both of them free merchants from having to carry large sums of money. And in order to uh, eventually get the money, though, a large banking system was developed where merchants could bring credit notes or checks and get cash in exchange. So basically the same system that we use today. All right, next let's talk about Islamic society. Just a couple of things of note here. Compared to most other civilizations at the time, Islamic society had very high levels of social mobility. Now remember, social mobility is the ability to move up and down, but really we're just talking about moving up in social class. Uh, this was impossible in Hindu society due to the restrictions of the caste system, and it was practically impossible in medieval Europe, where serfs were stuck at the bottom, you had to be born into nobility, there was really no way of being able to move up. That really wasn't uh, the case in Muslim society. The Quran teaches that all Muslims are equal before Allah. Plus, one of the five pillars is that zakat of giving to the poor, of giving to those less fortunate. So yeah, you still had rich families, but it was easier to rise up in Muslim society than in other parts of the world. That being said, slavery did exist. However, there was a very important condition of Muslim uh, slavery to remember, and that it was only of the conquered people. Okay? Uh, throughout human history, by far the most common way that people have ended up slaves is by being a prisoner of war or being conquered by another people. And this was true for Muslim society as well. But there was a little bit of a get out of jail free card. Uh, Muslims were not supposed to own other Muslims. It wasn't a set in stone rule where they could never. Uh, but if a non-Muslim slave converted to Islam, it didn't automatically get him or her out of slavery, but it did certainly increase their chances uh, of being freed at some point. Okay, so we've talked about how trade led to wealth. Now let's get into the other part of the golden age, the cultural achievement, starting first with literature. Nope, put that one up too soon, but that's all right. I'll put me up here. Nope, down here for now. There we go. Now Muslim literature had a strong tradition of oral poetry. Where am I here? There we go. 
Okay, so strong tradition of oral poetry going all the way back to the nomadic Arab days, even before Muhammad and Islam. And these poems often told stories of warriors and heroes, and like in medieval Europe, they often dealt with themes of chivalry and bravery. Now, poetry wasn't the only form of storytelling. The most famous collection of tales from the Arab world was uh, a collection of tales called The Thousand and One Nights. And it was a collection of very well-known Middle Eastern folk tales, some of which have remained part of uh, popular culture to the modern day. Things such as Sinbad the Sailor. You see this one over here, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. Right, the famous saying, open sesame in order to get into the cave. And the one that's probably the best known to modern American audience, Aladdin and his magic lamp. Now, while the original story did not have a giant blue singing genie, the Disney movie did incorporate some elements of the tale, such as the magical flying carpet. Now, Muslim architecture uh, was heavily influenced by Byzantine buildings, uh, especially the use of domes and arched doorways. The Dome of the Rock, let me get me out of the way so you get a better picture of it. Okay, we looked at that. We looked a quick picture of that in the last section. Uh, this is the most famous example, but you can see these architectural styles all throughout the Muslim world, such as inside this mosque that you got here. And this is actually found in Spain. Remember, Spain was under Muslim control for a long time. So this is in Cordoba, Spain, where you still have some uh, really impressive pieces of Muslim architecture. Now, why is this doing? there we go. Okay, uh, art. Now, Art is a very interesting aspect of Muslim culture. Uh, to understand Islamic, art, Islamic artistic styles, it's important to remember a very important religious belief in that idols are a no-no, right? Idolatry was banned by Muhammad. Now, remember that idols are statues or pictures of religious figures. Um, Hinduism uses them a lot for all their different gods. Here you have the god Ganesh here. Uh, Christianity in, uh, in Christianity, crucifix is an example of an idol. Well, according to Islam, these are not allowed, okay? You can't have anything like that. So, because of this, no humans are allowed to be depicted in religious art. That's why if you ever go into a mosque, you will never see paintings, stained glass windows, uh, statues of religious figures like Muhammad, anything like that. And because of these restrictions, the insides of mosques were decorated largely with geometric uh, shapes and repeating patterns. You're like, well, what does that mean? Let's take a look. All right, this would be a typical uh, artistic depiction, things like this and that and so forth. Now, at first glance, it doesn't look very creative. All right, you think, well, the, you know, what's so uh, impressive about that? It's not like they're painting or sculpting pictures of people and figures, but it's incredibly detailed and it's incredibly ornate. All right, an awful lot of artistry and uh, thought goes into making these. Um, it's also important to note that the restrictions against using humans was only for religious art. Non-religious art, such as a lot of the drawings that we've seen throughout the course of this chapter already, uh, they were okay that you could use humans. Okay, so again, it was only for religious art. Also, Muslim artists perfected calligraphy. Uh, we talked about calligraphy in a previous chapter. That was the art of beautiful writing. Right, let me get that out of there. Arabic script kind of lends itself well to it. Uh, it's kind of a flowing scriptive language. Uh, and this was especially uh, used for writing out verses of the Quran. Now, no golden age would be complete without some impressive advances in learning. And the Islamic Golden Age was no exception. In the last section, we discussed how Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Empire, became a center of learning with massive libraries, and they attracted scholars, philosophers, doctors, all people like that. And an important aspect of these learning centers was that they preserved the work of ancient Greece. All right, this picture here shows a group of men learning from a wise scholar. Okay, here's your wise scholar there. That scholar is actually Aristotle, the famed Greek philosopher we learned about back in chapter 4. Remember those big three philosophers of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. You're like, well, why is Aristotle in a uh, depiction of Muslim scholars? And that's because Muslims were a big fan of Aristotle, and they preserved his writings when much of it was lost to Western Europe in, uh, during the Dark Ages. Now, advances were also made in math, most notably with the development of algebra. The word itself is derived from the Arab word al-Jabbar, as you see here. So you have Muslim scholars to thank when you're learning about the quadratic formulas, fun stuff like that. They also adapted Arabic numerals uh, from India, as we discussed before. 
Uh, and they also figured out to, uh, the circumference of the globe. Remember, circumference meaning the distance of a circle all the way around. Now, this is well before sailors had made it all the way around uh, the globe. So they figured this out just by math. Uh, they determined the Earth was round simply by using math, and this was done hundreds of years before Columbus sailed across the Atlantic. Now, in addition to math, advances were also made in medicine. Medical understanding in the Middle East was far more advanced than in Europe at the time. It was also more efficient, and this was largely due to government-run hospitals. Caliphs paid for hospitals where the sick and injured could be treated. Uh, this reduced the risk of infection, and it also made it easier for doctors to treat them. Eventually, these Muslim medical books, let me get me out of the way here so you can see the whole thing. There we go. Eventually, these Muslim medical books became the basis for European uh, medicine after these books started to make their way back into Europe following the Crusades. All right, so that wraps things up for this one and uh, the Muslim Golden Age. And uh, we will talk in section four about Islam spreading into India.